in a blogging agency called Need Someone to Blog, and that's how I'm able to talk to you about finding your client's voice today. So, but before we get started on the topic, I want to tell you about something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. I went to dinner with a friend of mine who's a blogger. You may have heard of her. She's very well known in the WordPress space and also in the South. Her name is Kitty Lesby. And because she's from this area, I was asking her uh, about some some geographical things. I wanted to get to know what it was like in Raleigh because I'm from California and it's a very different world, right? <laughs> so um, in order to localize my talk, I just started up a conversation and said, so what's the barbecue like in North Carolina? <laughs> and, and Kitty said, well, unless you like the vinegary kind, there is, you don't want to do the barbecue, just trust the pork. And she said, because sometimes it's just ketchup with meat on it, and you never know what you're going to get, which I thought was a very interesting <laughs> approach, because all I'd heard was how great the barbecue was um, from Stephen Harvey, who uh, is somebody who works with my company. And so I laughed. I said, OK, tell me a little bit more about the South. She said, well, it all depends on where you draw the Mason-Dixon line. And then she informed me that Florida, even though it's in the South, is not part of the South. So it was interesting to get that perspective. And I was fascinated as she continued to tell stories about growing up here and sharing the differences between a been here and a come here. And since I am a come here today, um, it, it just it made me excited to be able to see what I was really going to experience. And I had to see it for myself. So I want to thank you all for coming out and um, being here to give me a chance to come to Raleigh and a, a reason to be here. So, so far, everything's been very welcoming, and I have to say that it's kind of been a life-changing experience for me to be here, um, and it's added depth to my own voice, because it's one more experience that I've had. Because I am a blogger, and I know my friend Bridget here is sitting in this first row saying, Jen, don't say you're a blogger. You're a writer. And um, I am a writer. I'm also a mom of eight kids. I'm an agency owner. I am many things. I, I'm the founder of Women Who WP. And so I've been very active in WordPress. But really, I am a blogger. And I blog on a lot of people's sites. I blog on my own site. And um, it's where my roots are. And whether I'm a writer too or not, I love to blog on websites. How many of you are bloggers in this room? OK. And how many of you blog for your own website? How many of you blog for other people's websites? OK. Good, there's a few of you. So this is a business opportunity. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't, it's something for you to realize is a service that you can provide. I've been writing since I was four years old, and I didn't really find my voice until I was 19. Prior to that, I was more of a technical writer. My job was at a newspaper, and um, I covered the police beat for them. And I also covered the police beat for my college newspaper, The Daily 49er. I knew how to organize my thoughts quickly, how to ask questions, and how to write in the inverted uh, uh, pyramid. And I thought I was pretty good at what I did. But the year I turned 19, I was surprised because something happened at my newspaper that sort of changed my voice and changed how I looked at my writing. One day in our editorial meeting, someone said that they wanted to cover my hairdresser's shop and to have a piece written on it. And I immediately raised my hand and volunteered because my hairdresser was my friend. I'd been to their shop. I'd tried all their services. I thought, this is going to be a shoe-in article. It'll be easy for me to write, and it will help bring my friends some business. So I did my due diligence. I made up my list of questions, and I planned a day at the salon. I even tried this flotation tank thing so that I could experience all of their services. And I thought I had every detail in order. So when I wrote my story and submitted it to my editor, I was convinced I had dotted every I and crossed every T. Well, an hour later, I got a call into the office. And I was told 
that they had reviewed my article and that I needed to understand that there was a difference between a feature and a news story. Your story is lacking heart, is what I was told. Turn it into something that someone wants to read. And I was shocked. I never had anybody say anything bad about my writing. But really, no, no one had ever said anything bad. And it happened that day. And so I went back to my desk and I cried. And a friend of mine who worked in the office was another writer. She came over and she sat with me. And I asked her for help. We started rereading the story together. And at first, I didn't see it, but she did. She said, tell me how you felt being there. Don't be afraid to let the laughter and the color and the true salon environment show through. No one expects or wants it to be a sterile article. You need to tell the story. And with her encouragement, I did. My article was published, on time even, and it created quite a sensation in our local community because it brought my hairdresser into the forefront. The people who went to the salon shared the story everywhere. It really paved the way for me and for her to become better known in the community, and it actually paved the way for me to become um, an editor of the newspaper and the quarterly magazine in time. And I take it all back to that story because that's where I learned to write with heart. And I kind of found my niche, in, or niche, in uh, later life because I started writing more of those kinds of reviews and um, more personality pieces because I found I had kind of a knack for it because they were easier for me to write and that's how I found my voice. When I walked into my hotel room yesterday, the first thing I noticed was a blanket folded neatly on the chaise lounge and it read, make your point. <laughs> so I'm gonna do exactly that and get to the reason why we're here today. So we're gonna be talking about blogging voice lessons or as the talk read, creating content in your client's voice for those of you who write for others. Last October, a client called me and said, Jen, I just read through some of the articles and blog posts that you wrote and I wanted to know where you found it. And I explained that we didn't find those posts. We didn't find them anywhere. They were written just for him in his blog, in his voice. And he was impressed. He'd hired bloggers in the past and they hadn't been able to create material that he felt reflected his voice. He said they were all canned posts. Well, canned posts are not the way to tell your client's story. They do not work for showcasing a product and they definitely are not the answer when you want to capture your client's voice and vision. You may be asking how a voice and vision can be related to blogging. Well, a vision is a grand dream or a company story broken into essential components. A voice is a mechanism by which that story is told. It can be written, it can be performed, it can be dance, music, even on stage. A voice in this context can even be considered an art. Last fall I was in Austin, Texas and I happened upon an outdoor art exhibit. It was named Hope. You can see it right here. And some of the locals even referred to it as the graffiti wall. I recognized it as a place where people would make their mark, similar to finding their voice, right? In the context, the, the acronym HOPE stands for helping other people everywhere. People travel from all over the world to paint their names and contribute temporary art to this terraced wall. They go to share their personal message and express their voice. How many voices and messages do you think are expressed on this wall? Well, I was there. There are thousands and they keep being painted over and over. So it continues to grow. Those messages of art are often replaced and sometimes the, the art that's there is modified so that the original art becomes unrecognizable. Someone who didn't understand the concept 
might view it as a wasted project. However, I didn't. I grabbed a can of uh, spray paint, because they have several there, and contributed a tiny bit of myself to the project, because I didn't want to give up the opportunity to have a voice on this wall, the Hope Wall. Content that has been outsourced to content mills or unvetted writers often has similar drawbacks. The subject isn't under. Oh, wait. That's not where I'm supposed to be. Hmm. Well, that's okay. Okay. Um, but so I had my opportunity to contribute my voice. And you can do that when you do when you write your own content. But not everybody has that opportunity. Sometimes if something's outsourced, it can it, it doesn't express the true vision of the company or the person who it's being written for. And so that's when outsourced content can be a problem. Um, the subject isn't understood, the meaning is lost, because a writer can't connect to the topic. It really can't adequately be described. And so I'm going to put this in a context that can be understood. But let's see. In coming here, I've seen some gorgeous scenery. Do you all agree? Yes, right? But I haven't seen the Apachalin, how do you say it? Appalachian, thank you. Trail, I haven't seen it. I can't describe it for you. But I'm sure there, who's seen it? Who's been there? OK, many of you could stand up here and tell me all about it. And, but I can tell you about the beauty of my drive from the Raleigh-Durham airport into town. Because all I saw were trees. I even took a video, sent it to my friends in California, look at this, because it was beautiful. Uh, and so I can adequately portray that. So. When I, I was in Austin, Texas last October, and um, there I tried barbecue, right? Going back to my discussion with Kitty. And um, I actually had three opportunities to try distinctly different barbecue. The first time I was recommended to go to a place called Vicks. It was a home style, family owned storefront, and the brisket was moist. And nothing like the barbecue I'd had in California. The following day, I ventured to a place called Cooper's in Llano. I tasted everything and was amazed at the flavor, and I thought I'd discovered the best barbecue ever. But on my final night in town, I was able to sample brisket and ribs from a food truck called Curlin and was blown away. It understood that Austin had good barbecue, just as I'm sure you do here. Maybe Kitty doesn't like it, right? Um, but I knew um, that that was, the, that was what the area was known for. And I was told it was better than California barbecue. But until I had tried it for myself, I had no idea what that meant. And now, as a blogger in California, I know that writing about barbecue from a restaurant in Austin, it's not something I would be capable of capturing because it's not something that I have in my repertoire. So context is lost when someone doesn't understand the area or topic. And by the way, I'm happy to try some North Carolina barbecue if anybody has suggestions on places I should go. OK, so now we're going to talk for a, little, uh, for a couple minutes about something that's unique to North Car or NC State, actually. Um, how many of you have been to the Butterfly Garden? Nobody. Do you guys know it's here? There's a Butterfly Garden. How cool is that? OK, well, how many of you have ever looked at a butterfly and like studied the patterns on its wings? OK, we've got some people who are nature people. Super cool. There's different patterns, the colors. Each butterfly. Um, is unique. And uh, at this butterfly garden, there are more than 50 species uh, that are represented. So it's a one of a kind experience. Every time you go there, you're not going to see the same um, butterflies. So bringing this back to WordPress, 
just as every butterfly is unique, that's what we need to see on the blogs, on your websites. We need to see unique, original content that is representative of who you are or who your company is that you're writing for. Now, blog posts typically have some commonality, just like butterflies all have wings, right? So for instance, there are many blog posts in the United States. Many of them are written in English. But do they all sound the same? No. Should they all sound the same? No. The tone or color of each is a reflection of the writer. And it's called their voice. So after reading several posts on the same blog, you become familiar with the style, whether it's casual, or written with local slang, or highly technical. The, and maybe it has odd bits in, of humor added to the post. These are the things that we start to recognize when we're capturing someone's voice. It may be something completely different. You may um, just notice that this writer always uses bullet points. But usually there is something recognizable. And sometimes you may come across a blog that seems really lackluster and like the content doesn't really relate. That's usually when you can find a client because that means they're having somebody put that blogging or do their blogging or create their website content that really doesn't understand how to capture a voice. As I said before, content is a context is lost when someone doesn't understand the topic or when they don't understand the feel of the company that they're representing. I'm going to share with you something that happened in, um, in my writing career. Uh, this is a scenario that I saw play out while working for a client that had hired, he had outsourced his blogging to an unknown vendor in another country. And he was trying to save money and thought that this would work, but his scrutiny was very low um, because he knew he didn't really value the posts and the posts weren't really, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, they weren't really valued by the client. So I was told to review the posts and make changes. Well, I took a lo the look at the first post and realized it was taking place in the Colorado mountains. And the community was very excited about these cats. There were cats that were coming to clean themselves on the mountain and um, that they, they would play in the snow. And I thought, this is really strange because I've been skiing, I've been to the snow, I don't think I've ever seen a cat play in the snow, other than maybe on YouTube. Have any of you ever experienced a cat playing in the snow? All right, so it's not a universal experience for sure. Um, so as I read through this piece that I was editing, I realized it wasn't about cats or kittens at all. It was about cats capital C, capital A, capital T. The little tractors that groom the snow. And everyone was excited because ski season, it was opening day. And they were getting ready by grooming the snow. And this is what this article was supposed to be about, was announcing when open day wa opening day was. But the person who had written it obviously had no experience with mountain life, <laughs> had no idea what, what they were talking about. And this could have gone live on the person's site had he not had me editing the post. And so had the blogger taken, even if they didn't live there, if they had just taken a few minutes to Google cat, all caps, because they recognized that it wasn't the same as a kitten, um, they probably would have found something relating to construction. And then if they had put in cat plus skiing, they might have made that connection. I had life experience that helped me to make the connection pretty easily, but not everybody does. Um, but when you don't, you should put some research into the topic that you're writing about to make sure that you are on track. So um, your context really does matter. And your clients deserve better than that kind of a mix-up. Wouldn't you agree? And you do too. If you're writing for your own content and you're trying to write something that maybe you don't fully understand, make sure you understand it before you write about it. Because better content and better topics lead to a better voice. 
So how do you develop and create that content for your client? <coughs> you first do it by listening to your client. So if you're writing for somebody else, you've got to really listen. And you need to think about it. Any music fans out there? OK. Could you tell the difference between a guitar solo by Eddie Van Halen and Stevie Ray Vaughan? Yes. <laughs> OK, I thought so. OK, are you able to recognize the difference between a Ford and a Toyota? Yes. If you hear the motor? OK. And can you tell the difference of voices in your family, different friends, different family members, without seeing them? So our voices are very important. I think sometimes we forget that. And we just think we can go through the motions. But it's, it's not true. We've got to capture that voice. So listening helps you to recognize that uniqueness. At my company, we, started, we start the voicing process for our clients by interviewing the client. We listen for unique phrases. And we make small talk with them. We ask about recent books they've read and magazines that they look at and websites they go to and why they like them. We ask about their favorite places to visit locally because we want to have a community connection in their blog. And um, this might give you insight into the type of content that resonate, resonates with each client. So you can ask them about their competition. You can find out what their competition's writing about or get the websites and do your own research so that you understand some other topics that you might want to go into. And you also should ask them ways that they want to stand out as a brand. Because what you're writing about, if you're writing it in a unique and organized fashion, and you're putting in your titles and your meta descriptions and your alt tags and all the things that you know you need to do to create good content, um, if you're doing that, it's going to be found in search engines. And if it's found in search engines, you want that company to be found for the right terms. So it's super important to find out what their objective is in having you blog. And you might want to ask them even for five adjectives that describe their brand so that you understand how they look at their company. Or ask them to describe a current client, or a past client, or the perfect client. You can set the tone through creating the voice. So there are several tones that we use at my company. One is the professional voice. And we use this when we write on more corporate type blogs because sometimes it's necessary to adopt a formal authoritative style. Uh, this doesn't mean that we cut out personality. It's not eliminated. However, we play it down a little bit, I would say. The key to keeping this style engaging while you're playing it down is to provide details. Sometimes a case study is the best way to do this because you're explaining what your company does. You're explaining how it affects other users or um, you know, vendors or whatever the case study may be about. And that is, is a great way to showcase your work so other people know what it is that you do. Another voice is the neighborly voice. So this style is one we use on a lot of our community blogs. Um, it's more casual in tone. And it can be used um, to really make an com emotional connection. A lot of lifestyle bloggers use this neighborly voice. Because it's a great way to showcase relatable events and s your stories. Uh, humorous voice is another one you've probably seen on websites. Uh, this is one where if your client likes to joke a lot, pay close attention because you might get a good understanding of what type of jokes they would use in their content. You might be able to, just from your conversation, pull one of those jokes and use it in their content. And when someone, one of their clients, reads their blog, they're going to recognize that. They're going to see it. So it's important to pay attention to those little cues. And if you do have a client who would like this humorous voice, one of the things that would be really good is to talk to them about, hey, if you hear of any good jokes, if you have any funny stories, tell them to me. Send this quick email. 
you know, all that you need is two sentences, and you can pretty much flesh that out into a couple of paragraphs in a blog um, if you know your client well enough. Or at least it works for us. Another voice is the newsroom voice. That's kind of that professional um, inverted pyramid style that I was talking about in the very beginning that I did at the newspaper. I don't prefer that style anymore, um, but you see it all the time on the internet. And the reason why they used to do that is because with newspapers, they used to cut from the bottom um, to fit the page. And so the most important information had to be told first, and then it went down to include more details as you went further on the page. It can easily come across as stuffy or arrogant, and so you have to be careful with this style because if it's done wrong, it can be off-putting. We don't want that. We want engagement on those blogs. But if you write for a, a news-based company, this may be the style that they want. And so if you are doing that, then adding some community stories into that content can help to develop an authoritative voice, um, even though it's newsy. Because it, gives, it, it shows that they know who their target audience is, and it pulls people in. Uh, the curious, tentative voice. OK, so this might be a weak way to start a blog, it, some people might say. Um, because blogging should be about sharing what you know. So you should be coming from a place of authority. However, sometimes you want to write a piece that asks a question that says, this is the way I think it is, or is it? Because then you'll get comments. You'll get people who engage in your topic because they might have a differing opinion. It may reframe how you want to um, continue to write for that client, even, because you could use uh, a support queue, for instance, and get some questions and ask the question rather than answering it. So you can kind of flip everything around, and you'll find that when you do that, and you're curious about what the client wants, or you're curious about how they solve this issue, that you'll get a lot of shares on those type of posts. So I don't use this a lot, but uh, with our clients, every once in a while, we do do a curious voice post just to kind of bring it all together. So, and the reason why we don't do it a lot is because it's, it involves risk. The client has to take a risk and be a little vulnerable when they're reaching out to their audience versus just saying this is how it is. So these voices sum up the bulk of what we use for our client work. However, I'm sure you can think of more. Um, as professional bloggers, we use these as guides and like I said before, move between these voices. And usually, having a combination produces results that our clients love. And it connects them with their audience, it connects them with their community, and it gives them credibility. So I'd advise you all to do the same. <laughs> uh, and and when, when you're doing this, when you're thinking about how you're going to approach this client uh, blogging interaction and how, what topics you're going to use, sometimes it makes sense to review emails. And so I'm going to tell you, uh, like, <sighs> um, because sometimes you'll notice that your clients start a word with a sentence. I have one client who starts like every third paragraph with the word and. And you know, capital and, which is not something that's technically correct um, or common usage, but it's the way she writes. And so, if we're writing her blog, we're going to be starting every third paragraph or fourth paragraph with the capital and, because we want to be in her voice. We want the clients that she's emailing on a regular basis to see that it's her blog. Uh, the questions you can ask is, uh, do, does your client often write in a third or first person? They probably won't know. But you can tell that by reading what they have written or by reading what they're writing in their emails. Two years ago, I went on an extended trip to Europe, and I worried that my email would go unanswered while I was gone. I spent several months training my assistant on typical responses for our company and created a few templates and spent a few, the next few months 
reviewing what she was sending to clients to make sure that it was in my voice, our company's voice, really. Um, and we made adjustments. And then two weeks before I was due to leave, I noticed something. I saw that just about every email used the words, I appreciate you, somewhere in it. And I thought that was so weird. Like, who says that, right? And that phrase just kept coming up. So um, I hadn't spoken to my assistant about it. And I just kept thinking about it. And then I looked at emails that I was sending to my clients. And I realized I totally overused this phrase. I was saying, I appreciate you, or so appreciate you, or some variation on it in almost every email I sent, which is why my assistant had incorporated it. I never use it anymore, because like, that freaked me out a little. But I realized that even my voice could be learned. So interesting point to note if you're starting your own business and you want to hire other writers to work with you. So in order to involve your client, you're going to read your client's past writing, everything from blog posts to emails. And you're going to look for those word patterns, buzzwords that seem unique. Um, notice their length of sentences. Some people write really short sentences. Some people write all compound three line sentences. You don't have to sacrifice your grammatical or um, graphical style necessarily in doing this, but maybe you slowly bring your client into a, a line that is more uniform that people are used to reading um, when you notice something that seems a little odd. But you want to make that a gradual change, because the audience will gradually shift to understand that. So if you have a client that makes references to growing up in the 80s, what are you going to put in their blog posts? References to growing up in the 80s, right? Um, if they mention locations all the time, you're going to want to mention locations, because they might be very map-based. You want to use these things in your content. And you also want to notice words that are not used. So when, if someone were to blog for me, I never swear. If somebody put something that was even close to a swear word in my blog post, we would know it wasn't written by me. Right? right. We would. We would know that. Uh, <laughs> but there are other words. Like some people will never use the word actually. Or will, there are just words that when you look at enough of someone's writing, you realize that those words are missing because they could have replaced with them, and they don't. So I want you to make a note of that. Keep a little journal on each client or a little, you know, uh, something in your computer as you track your client notes. Listen for those repeated phrases, favorite quotes maybe you can ask them about, and add these things into your post to add authenticity to them. Punctuation has trends as well. Often in social media, I use two exclamation points when I'm excited about something. So you can tell if a tweet has been written by me, because I usually put two exclamation points. Um, I also am very much in favor of hashtags. And so often, my Twitter account will have four or to six hashtags just because I'm having fun with it, even though social media experts would tell me not to put that many in. So, though, um, so professionally, I might recommend a different style than what I do, but that's my style. That's what I do. And so with one of our clients, um, he had, trying to remember, I think it was like every tweet for the last four years was five words or less, no hashtags. And I just looked at that, and I was like, what are you trying to convey? You know, how are you trying to get people places? But we had to write in his style, because I didn't want anyone calling out the tweets we were putting on his um, Twitter account as being something that wasn't generated by him. And so we adapted. It's very different from my style, though. Uh, so my goal is that when a post or a page on a website, when anything that is added to that site goes on there, it feels like who the author is supposed to be. It shouldn't feel like the author's guest blogger or ghost blogger. So if you notice that the posts are starting to sound like you, you're doing something wrong. So 
keep those tabs, keep the notes, and uh, realize what the no-no words are, what the uh, key phrases are that are used often or should be used often, and, um, and think about the location and favorite quotes and genre references, and then watch social media so that you can see how people comment back, and if your client comments back to them, watch that discussion because that may impact the posts that you're writing. And have your client become aware. Ask them to let you know. It's really good to have that buy-in. It may not be that they contact you every, you know, you may hear from them once every four months, and they may say, oh, this is happening in my community. We really want to write about this. I'm providing the swag. Here's four pictures to use. And that's something that really is great because you can bring that into the post that you had slated to write for that event. I have a client who desperately wanted to be, you know, number one, first page of Google. This was about four years ago when it was a lot easier to do that. And uh, there's a lot less competition, um, but not for her phrase. Her phrase had a lot of competition because she's in a very exclusive area. And so we had a long talk about it because she was three. And she's like, Jen, we've been blogging for a year. Why am I not in slot one? And I said, we need an event. We need something that's going to push you up there. And I said, so I need you to watch. And when a celebrity comes to your community, and she's like, well, I can't, I can't invade their privacy. And I said, no, I'm not asking you to invade their privacy. But if something happens where you're in a place where we can get a lot of traction to your blog, I said, it could just be going down to the beach when OP Pro is going on. You know, and, and just happening to be in a picture with Christian Slater or something, and, and being able to tag that and send people to the blog, because we'd write a quick blog. I said, just snap a picture. Just do whatever you can. So she went away thinking, OK, what can I do? And um, about three weeks later, on a Saturday night, I get this phone call. And this client, uh, I've been working with her for a long time. And so she never calls me on the weekend. So I picked up because I was shocked. And um, she said, you'll never believe it. George Clooney is here. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, I am in the theater. He produced a movie, and he is showing it. And I'm here with him. And I said, get a picture. <laughs> so she did. And it wasn't a picture with him, with, with her and him. It was a picture of him standing in front of the stage. And then we wrote a blog post, or we, we wrote a blog post um, about what was, what was showing and um, the fact that they were there together. But then the title combined her keyword term and his name. And we tweeted it out and got it on Facebook. And before we knew it, we had tons of traffic to the site. And she's been that first place ever since because that one event pushed her to the top. And since we do continual content, she stayed there. Uh, real estate. So very competitive industry. So it's important that you respect what the client might bring to the table. And if they have talent, if they have events, if they have an eye for something, bring that into the blog and incorporate their ideas as well as your own. So like that guitar solo, you need to showcase your voice and use it to help your readers engage. Use authority because you know the topic. You've done the research if you're the writer for the blog or if it's your own blog. Don't fear intensity because people love to read editorial pieces. And be consistent. We recommend twice weekly blogging for all of our clients. And we follow that up with social media posting because if it's just on the blog and you don't have an established audience, those posts are going to go unseen unless you're sharing them. Paint a picture with your words. A cyclist whizzing past evokes a very different meaning than a bike rode by. Read each post after you've written it and give it an honest assessment. And rewrite it if it doesn't capture the voice as you'd hoped. And find and tell the truth. Uh, we use some tools to help us to do this. Uh, we have, for our clients, we use Google Drive. Um, and 
uh, a series of spreadsheets to track the posts that are being written for them and the topics. But if we find something that's more relevant or timely, that takes place, you know, if that's going to happen before the next scheduled post, we'll write on that and push the scheduled post because we want to be, um, we want our clients to be in the know. And there's also other options that you can use to track these things. I know some people use Trello to track how they're going to keep ideas for blog posts. Uh, and those are good options. But what you need to do is file any posts away that you think are particularly good. So if you have other people writing on your team, you can use those to teach them how to write for this particular client. Or you can use those posts to help you to find your voice when you maybe have too much going on and you can't quite get your head in the game, sometimes reviewing particularly good older posts is a great way to do that. And visualization. So there are times where it can be hard to turn on that voice, like I was saying. And so when that happens, we use a method uh, or a technique that's similar to method acting, um, where we advise our writers to pretend that they're the accountant or the lawyer, or the community leader, and then they write as them. And it helps in capturing the right voice when you're having trouble. Because our job is to create an extension of the client. Learn to think and write as your client would if they had the time. So to sum it all up, here are my top 15 tips for ghostwriting. One, develop a target reader. Two, envision your client's goal. Three, create that client avatar, a voice that you're going to use specifically when writing for that client. Four, keep a file of all of your client's information in each article you write for them. And hold on to information like quotes and no-no words and phrases. And do uh, five, do your research. Look at the past blog posts and current posts that are in the client's writing style and talking style so that you can understand how to write for them. Six, observe and interview your client and listen to how they talk and portray themselves. This will help develop confidence and help you to develop that voice even more. Seven, read things out loud. I don't think I mentioned that, actually. But um, if you try talking in your client's voice, you'll know if it matches them. Uh, let's see. Eight, tailor your voice to your medium. So if it's a press release, a blog post, an informational article, each of those may require something a little different. Nine, write something you would read. Ten, be unique and make yourself stand out. Make that post stand out. So be credible and helpful in each one, if you can. And eleven, take risks. Because if you don't feel a little adrenaline when you're pushing publish, that may not be your best piece. 12, communicate with your client. 13, have confidence and authority in your writing because people need to be pulled in. 14, decide about the formal, informal, and maybe even tour the company to get a feel for what their actual environment is like. And 15, invent a specific brand or voice you can bring as the ghostwriter that is your own, but that conveys their feelings and their, the feel of their blog. If the client wanted the words to sound exactly the same as before, they probably wouldn't have hired you. So whether you ghostwrite or blog for yourself, I'd like you to remember this quote by Alan Alda, which oddly enough, I found on my hotel key card when I checked into Raleigh. Um, you have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition. So trust yourself, put your heart into the content you write, and post your blog, and then push publish. Get it out there. So thank you for listening to me today. I'm Jen Miller, founder of Need Someone to Blog, and you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at jenblogs for you. And if you have any questions, I'm here, or we can meet in the happiness bar if we're out of time. <laughs>